Professor Poix, speakers of the Global Young Scientists Summit 2017, young scientists and invited guests. Good afternoon. I'm Sonia from the National Research Foundation, and I will be your MC this afternoon. It's been an exciting week of science and technology for all of us. Before we start the closing ceremony proper, a final lecture. Please welcome Dr. Jurgen Kluge, chairman of the Lindau Foundation Board, to give us a special Lindau lecture. Dr. Kluge will share his thoughts on a career in science and management. Dr. Kluge, please. Good afternoon. Can we do a little bit better? Good afternoon. Much better. So usually at that point in the talk, you say you are so honored to give that talk and so thrilled to be in Singapore. Hey, I'm scared like hell. You had a week of talk of luminaries, Nobel laureates, uh, Turing Prize winners and so forth. And now it's me, a simple PhD in physics, and a professor in mechanical engineering. So I'm scared. I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the Nindau Nobel Laureate meetings. It starts with a title. It's a real good marketing title. Uh, but as a chairman of the foundation, I found it wrong. It's not the Nobel Laureate meeting in Lindau. It's a meeting of the young scientists in Lindau with the Nobel Laureates. So it's all about the young scientists. But before we start the lecture, I thought I'd introduce myself. Look who is talking. So I'm pretty old, as you can see. I did laser physics. I teach at the University of Darmstadt, mechanical engineering, everything around IT and production. So production industry 4.0, that's the topic. I got an offer by now Nobel laureate Ted Hench uh, to become his postdoc. I declined and instead of that joined McKinsey and Company, a consultancy, 
and worked there for 25 years. Then I became a CEO of a family-owned company. In uh, one point in time, I was a boss of 330,000 people. So an army worldwide, basically, under my command or so. Uh, you can't be a boss of 330,000 people. Maybe you can inspire them. Uh, now I'm retired from that job. I'm a member of a few boards, including one in Finland, Fastems. I'm a senior advisor to Bank of America, uh, honorary consul for Finland, and the chairman of the Nobel Laureate meetings. Those talks tend to go a little bit in the direction granddad is talking about the war and the war stories. Uh, you have to remember we were young too. So here is a photo for my 18th birthday on the left side and on the right side I grew my hair. You did that, uh, still had hair in those days. Uh, in those days we said don't trust anybody over 30. Uh, that was because of the Second World War, obviously. Everybody who was involved in the dreadful deeds of the Holocaust and the war was over 30, so we basically said, don't try anybody over 30. But we were young. We also were young. You can't imagine that when you look at me, but we were young. And we wanted to change the world. And Mother Nature is gracious to us. You want to grow up when you are 10 till 1820, to go to the adult movies, to drink beer, to drive a car, to do whatever you imagine you can do when you are an adult. And then you think you are on the height of the time. When you are 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, I still believe I'm on the height of the time. And some of our laureates you have seen, they are still young at heart and young in mind. And then in the end of your life, I've seen that with my father, you get older again, and then apparently uh, you die. The good thing is some of us can remember how it felt being young. In my time, So in my time, it was a car that meant freedom, not the smartphone. And I'm still embarrassed when I look at my shoes there. That was my first car. Um, yeah, that meant for us freedom. And I'm still believing our generation has a better music. So <laughs> excuse me for, for that. Um, I hope by now you are awake. Uh, by Steppenwolf and Born to be Wild. And uh, as I said, I could listen to that mu music for hours and hours, but I have to continue with my talk. So I thought I'd do the following. I give you a few thoughts in retrospect. Uh, I went through my mind and uh, selected it a little bit. What would have I loved to know at 30 which I now know much better and can bring to, to a point. I want to share that with you, and in the end we will do a test how much you remember from those 12 points. I'm kidding, I'm not doing a test. You will remember three or four, but that's good enough. It's always, uh, you will remember only a fraction of what's told to you. So those are the 12 points, and then a little advertisement uh, come to Lindau. It will be a movie. Let me start with the first point. In my view, we really live in revolutionary times. You can compare our time basically with three events in communication in history before. One is the invention of speech. That's what I'm doing now, storytelling. That was a great invention for mankind. The second one was writing. 
even better, you could write something, call a horseman, and send the horseman, and you invented mail. Or you could communicate with people that lived after you. You write your last will, and then you hope it's executed. The next revolution in communication was Mr. Gutenberg from Mainz. Printing press with removable letters. Uh, before that, you had to write books by hand, so you copied the Bible, monks did that, one piece after the other handwriting. And now it got really cheap to communicate. The follow-up of that was uh, the Reformation, the split-up of the Catholic Church, the Thirty Years' War, and the French Revolution. And now we are in the forced revolution in communication. The first took 10,000 years, writing 1,000 years, Gutenberg 100 years, and now in 20 or 10 years, we have a digital revolution, uh, and we are in the midst of it, and we don't see that a revolution is going on. Why is that? I guess uh, Wind might have told you even better than I, uh, can do that. Uh, it's the power of exponential laws. It's not a physics law, it's a heuristic. Uh, it's called, as you know, Moore's law. Uh, every one and a half year, uh, computing power is doubling and the uh, cost of computing is going down. That's all logarithmic scale. The power of exponential functions is unimaginable. There's a story you might know about the inventor of chess. He invented the game for the Shah of Persia, the Emperor of Persia. And then the Shah liked it very much and uh, liked to play chess. And he said, what can I do for you? And the guy answered, I want one rice corn on the first field of the chessboard, two on the second, four on the third, eight, and so forth. And if you do that, he said, that's easy, I'll do. Uh, you get to your rice. If you do that on the 64th field, if a rice corn is 30 milligrams, which is roughly true, uh, you have 276 trillion tons of rice. That's so much rice that you cover whole of India 30 centimeter high with rice. And everything is about the last thing. All on the second to last, of it's half of it and a quarter and so forth. So that's the exponential power. It goes like that and then it explodes. Uh, number one. Uh, that means in floating point operations per second, a laptop is now 10 powered by 11 flops. Your brain is 10 powered by 16. In 15 years, laptops will equal the human brain. If you have a world population then of 10 billion, uh, 10 powered by 16 times 10 powered by 10, 10 powered by 26, so all the brains of the world population will be equaled in a laptop in the year 2045 if that uh, continues that way, and every science I will continue that way. Um, should that scare us? I don't think so. It's a huge opportunity. As always, it's an amplifier for everything that's good or bad. The second thing that comes together uh, to that development is uh, Metcalfe's law. Again, a heuristic law. What is the benefits of value in networks? If you have mobile phones, for example, telephones, fax machines in the old days, one telephone is good for nothing. Whom do you call? Nobody. Two telephones are better. 20 telephones in a little village, you can call the fire department, the police, uh, whatever. Your mother-in-law will call you several times a day, most probably. So Metcalfe's law says the value of network scales with n times n minus 1. 
for large n for gets a minus one, it's n square. So it goes up like that. The cost go up with n because you have to buy all those mobile phones. And then a little bit of hardware uh, in the network. So in one point in time, n square rules and you have huge benefits. So imagine a world where everybody has two mobile phones and every piece of equipment is connected to the internet and communicating. That's what's going on and the third development is obviously software. In memory computing, uh, you can look and search the whole communication of whole countries, uh, email and phone and uh, everything like our US friends do. Uh, so what else can you do? Those three things come together. Everything that can be digitized will be digitized and we will see it. You are in the midst of that revolution. So don't set your targets too low. My second point is anything goes, the sky is the limit, and maybe not even the sky is the limit. Being a laser physicist, I thought, how come people to those ideas? The first the microwave, the maser, and then the light uh, amplifying uh, by stimulated emission was invented. It's Mayman, uh, Towns, Charlotte, and others in the 50s and 60s. But the idea was around much longer. That's from the novel, The War of Worlds, written by A.G. Wells in 1898. So, the intense heat they project in a parallel beam against any object they choose by means of a polished parabolic mirror is unknown composition, much as a parabolic mirror of a lighthouse projects a beam of light. And there is an illustration. So that's uh, more than 100 years ago. The Martians are invading Earth, and they have obviously something like a CO2 laser where they can set things in flames. And it's always young people like you reading those stories, and if it's not forbidden by laws of physics, and the laser obviously isn't, it will materialize in one point in time. It might not be the easiest solution, there might be other solutions out of the solution space, but it will materialize. Um, there's a second story to that. Uh, when you go for uh, the moonshot, there was Jules Verne, the French novelist, writing the story about the travel to the moon, and he had his rocket started in Florida, pretty close to Cap Canaveral in the novel. And then Tsiolkovsky, a Russian scientist, read it, wrote a book, and uh, Hermann Obert, a German scientist, uh, wrote the book, uh, Die Rakete zu den Planetenräumen, with the first equations on it. That was read by a young kid called Werner von Braun, and the, this guy then developed a rocket that was fired on London and other cities, in the Second World War, the first operational rocket that went in space, and then the, he went to the US, and he was the guy behind uh, Saturn V, the strongest rocket ever built that never failed. Uh, and you might remember that one, Star Trek, the first Captain Kirk on the left side. You were most probably pretty young, and he is talking into a device that was then science fiction. It materialized as Motorola's phone. You could uh, go for the iPad, the language translation, the iPhone, uh, the replicator that uh, went alive as 3D printer. So everything you can think of, and it's not forbidden by the basic laws or by too much energy consumption. That's the second thing. I mean, I read articles about warp drives that can be done. Energy consumption will be a little bit high, I guess, but uh, everything that can be thought of will be done. So uh, don't set your targets uh, too low. You will manage and uh, eventually, after hard work, 
get there. How do you do that? You have to get out of your comfort zone. Everybody has a comfort zone. I hate speaking to large audiences uh, and other things. I do it despite I hate it. We once had a training uh, at the consultancy I worked for, was at a nice golf court uh, in Denver, in the US. We came to the golf course and then we were kind of scared because there were telegraph poles on the golf course. I'm afraid of hate. I, I, I avoid the Alps. I don't want to climb up somewhere. I'm a guy for the North Sea and uh, flat and, and everything. But on that golf course, there were telegraph poles. And on the top of those telegraph poles, there was a pizza-sized plate. So everybody of us would do the left experiment. So step on the chair, step on the table, and step on the pizza plate. Our body does that. You can turn around if you want. Our body does that without hesitation. The guys, our trainers there told me, the height of maximum terror for a human being is in the order of 14 meters. So when you are falling down here from the stage, my brain says, my, says myself, hey, that's not good. You will hurt yourself and break your leg maybe, but you won't die. If you are in a hot air balloon or in an airplane, it's so out of our reach of imagination, it's so irreal that we don't be scared. But 14 meters is exactly where the human being says, hey, if I fall down, I'll die. So climb up. 14 meters, and then the last thing is, is the most difficult, to make that step on the pizza plate on top of the pole in 14 meters. And what you learn is switch off your brain. Your body will do it. It's pretty easy. It's the same movement you do when you step on the table. So get out of your comfort zone, confront yourself, then you will learn, you will lose your fear, and then you will be able to do remarkable things. That doesn't mean you have completely to switch off your brain all time. It's good when you are on telegraph poles uh, to rely on your instincts. Otherwise, the real adventures are in your head. As I said, I did laser physics. There's a photograph in the middle, that's my lab, ultra-short light pulses in those days with dye lasers. Very fascinating. I loved it. I mean, it's like playing an instrument, it's fine mechanics, adjusting the thing. Uh, the formulas are elegant, the fascinations of lasers. At night, I went out with my students and performed laser light shows. That was kind of a new treat. I earned some money, that was good. We come to some of the usages of money later in the talk. And after switching to consultancy, I was a little bit homesick to my physics, to the color of the lasers, uh, to everything I adjusted in the lab. Uh, but after a while, I realized that uh, in my head, the real adventures uh, and they are exciting. So one of those projects was to do a strategy for the inventor of the passenger car, Mercedes-Benz, that place in 1988. And I was a project manager and I had no clue how to develop a strategy for a car manufacturer. And I said, hey, we do something that hasn't been done before. We do big data analysis in those days on mainframes. There is a survey when you buy a new car. Uh, you have to fill out a questionnaire, statistically relevant. When you buy a car, every 10th customer has to fi fi fill it out. If it's a Toyota, every 10,000 customer. So there are 200,000 data sets called the new car buyer survey. 
those data sets were available. Nobody did anything with the data sets. And uh, our friends at Mercedes were a little bit worried. They bought this tiny little, then called Baby Benz, now it's called the C-Class. And who bought it? Pensioners. The average age was 65 years old. Uh, the BMW 320 was the great competitor, growing like hell, and we found out why. Uh, the Mercedes was bought for reliability and comfort, and the BMW for performance and styling. You see the figures there. That came out of a factor analysis. It's a little bit like if you have a uh, odd-shaped body and you want to have the main axis of uh, the inertia moment, the same type of calculation. And then in that nine-dimensional space, we did a segmentation uh, and a cluster analysis and you could position single cars. And then it became really clear, you have to do other things with your car to get into the second segment. And out came the first small Mercedes sports car, the SLK. Out came, we start car racing again. Uh, the silver arrows we visited. Those guys here, this is a now 70-year-old German Formula One driver, Jochen Maas, and then Karl Wendlinger, Franzen, and this is young Michael Schumacher. They hired him and they started prototype racing. In the second year, the car did win Le Mans. Now they are in Formula One racing. Uh, and uh, this is a new car, will be out soon. So they shifted the complete image into the sporty, racy uh, design side. All adventures that are in your head, even going uh, to car design. The foundation of all that, even if a decision to buy a car, for example, is highly emotional, the foundation should be rational. So, true and false, not like and dislike, are the categories. For that, we go a little bit into game theory. I used that case for recruiting uh, for many, many years. So I made it a little bit uh, more peaceful, uh, so they, those, four, uh, those three people are not shooting at each other, but are shooting at the balloons. So we have a guy A, B, and C. They all have tiny little handguns, and they all have balloons. So who will win? Obviously, we don't know. But all is equal. They're standing on an equal-sized triangle, the balloons are equal, equal size, the guns are equal, there is no cheating going on, and there are strict rules, you can't simply shoot. It's one shot at a time, and it is decided by a fair dice, so a third chance that you can shoot, and the only survivor wins. And the question is, who will win? Can't answer it yet. They have different skills. So Mr. A is a shootist, at that distance he hits at 80%. Mr. B is average, 60%, and C is an amateur, 40%. So who will win? At that point, many people say it's, it's clear the best shootist will win, it will be Mr. A. But a closer look uh, to it, how would you decide to shoot on whom it's known that Mr. A is the best shootist. So that happens. B will target A because it's the toughest competitor. C will target A, it's the toughest competitor. And A will shoot at B. So that makes our life much easier now. Nobody is shooting at C. This little guy runs unnoticed, basically. So there are only two cases we have to look at. In the end game, where you have two, it's either A with C or B with C. 
So what's the probability? A little bit of calculation going on here. A third, A, A and C occurs when B, B's balloon is exploded. Uh, that's exactly a third. A has a right to shoot times 80%. Or it's B and C, A is exploded, it's a third times 60, plus a third times 40, it's a third. So now we have the two configurations. Now we go for the win. It's the probability of occurrence. And then we change the dice. It's uh, half and half. And A will win. Uh, we get rid of all the thirds and halves. and That doesn't matter. So 80 times 80.64. C will win 32. B will win 0.6. And here is a second chance for C, 0.4. So if you add that up, C will win. C is the most likely winner with 0.72. You can norm that to 100%. I made the numbers that it's pretty close. But C is the likely winner of that game. Hmm, interesting. A is the best shooter. He's annoyed about the result. What can he do? He could decide to arm C because he is the most likely winner in the end. Does it make it better? You can at home do the mathematics. Irrational decisions make it worse. What makes it better is training. So let's take C. We know it's uh, 37%, and now he starts training. It's get better for him to the point where he reaches 60. At that moment, A will decide not to shoot at B anymore, but he will shoot at C. So probability will drop. Then he will continue to train. It's getting better. And when he is at 80, everybody will shoot at him, and so forth. So what do we learn out of that? Irrational behavior makes it worse. Soft power, being small, is maybe not a bad thing. Training is a good thing to a certain extent. And this very, very simple setup at rules, you get a highly nonlinear configuration that most people can't predict. Only three people, one parameter that differs, and you get a result to that. So stick to rationality. Before you jump into solving a problem, it's good to understand the structure of the problem. What could possible solutions be? Uh, I have here, as example, three types of solution functions, utility functions for problems. One is a classical, where you have an optimum in the middle of the solution space. The tax rate is an example for that. Tax rate zero is not good. Tax rate 100% is not good either. So somewhere in the middle, there's an optimum point. If you are a socialist, you say it's 60%. If you are a market liberal, you might see 35%. But our political system is geared to do those compromises for a very tough problem. They find a solution. They adjust the solution over time. And uh, you have a problem like that. Then there are other problems, hunger and poverty. The more, the better. The less hunger, the better. The more education, the better. So you have an optimum at the end of the solution space. And then there are a few tough problems in the world where you have a solution, like on the right side, uh, there is a from the area where my father was born, there is a poet. He lived in the Thirty Years' War, von Logau. And he said in German, in großer Gefahr und Not bringt der Mittelweg den sicheren Tod. In cases of very high danger, the middle course will be certain death. So you have to decide. And in many questions that deal with war and peace, 
with the Iron Curtain, the opening of the East, the reaction to nuclear missiles uh, placed by the Soviet Union in those days, you have to decide. Waging a war with a handbrake on is not a good thing. If you wage a war, you have to go full blast, the Vietnam lecture. Um, in Germany, the refugee crisis. We have a problem with that because we treated it like a problem on the left side. So you had the right-wing people saying, hey, uh, close the borders, and you have the left-wing people saying, integrate them all and welcome them all. And the truth is it's a bipolar solution. You have to integrate those that are willing and fitting and the others. You have to control your borders, you have to fight the terrorists, you have to be very tough. So it's a bipolar uh, solution. And political systems in democracies uh, struggle to bring that solution forward. They tend to go for the compromise and it might be a false compromise. So, go for the problem solving. How can you then go on? And I saw always friendly competition. Uh, it's in sports. Here you see myself and my predecessor as head of the office uh, of McKinsey in Germany, a very ambitious man, he liked to win. So we battled it out on the soccer field and uh, he hired that guy here uh, for his team. You might know him, it's Franz Beckenbauer, the German world class player from the 70s. Uh, he cheated a little bit, uh, but in the end, we won the game in a fair competition. Beckenbauer promised not to score goals. So in science, in sports, and in politics, you should play cooperative games. The saying is you see each other twice in life. And that's why even business is a cooperative game. It's not a one-time thing where you don't see the other ever again and you can behave uh, like you wish or uh, like in bad dreams. You see the other partner in sports, in science, in business again and it should be a fair and friendly uh, competition. That's the mystery of market economy, the mystery of democracy, and uh, often in sports. What is sometimes underestimated by scientists is that management matters. Management matters in problem solving. Uh, there's a first step in problem solving, which is called structure the problem. In your language, find the right coordinate system. So when you should calculate the volume of a soccer ball, polar coordinates make it easy. If you try it in Cartesian coordinates, it's really, really difficult. And if you calculate the volume of a cube, coordinates, Cartesian coordinates are the choice. You can do it in polar coordinates as well, but it's really difficult. So this is the moment of intuition in science where you find the right structure, the right coordinates for your problem. In business, you call that MISI, mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive. So you want to cover all dimensions, uh, but you will and want them linear independent. If you have done that, it's straightforward. You have to measure. You have a scale. If it's linear, it's good. It could be logarithmical, whatever. You have a scale, and if it's linear, you have two points. One is zero, one is 100%. One could be your own position. One could be a competitor's position. One could be your target. So you, could, you are able to measure. This next step is you differentiate. You ask, why is that? Why I am not at 100%? Why is my quality at 90% and not at 100? Why is that? Because my workers uh, screw up. Why do the workers screw up? Because they are overworked and tired. Why are they overworked and tired? Because the light 
lighting of the uh, floor is not good enough, so the eyes get tired. Why is that? Because we have to change the light bulb. And when you have asked the fifth why question, you are pretty close to the solution. You simply turn it into uh, the solution. So that's how to have a scientific method, even in business. For all of you that are working with large machines, accelerators or whatever, you know that the uh, utilization of those machines is pretty important. Here's an a example that is car production, but an accelerator would fit the same model. You either work on the working time, could be 365 days a year, 24 hours. You can work on the productive time and uh, not have idle times and breakdowns and repair and maintenance and so forth. And you can uh, speed up the machine, crank it up. For all practical purposes, uh, that's linear independent. If you go to the extremes, it's not. If you work 24 hours, 365, every maintenance will give you a kick here and uh, bring down your uh, uptime. If you turn up the machine too fast, you will get more wear and tear and uh, you have to repair it more often. So when you go to the extremes, those axes are not linear independent anymore, but you see what you can reach with small advantages in those three dimensions, you get huge improvements. Uh, so an example uh, how to do that. The second thing is project management. This is an example from car manufacturing. The Japanese showed that they, in half the time, can set up factories. And uh, the main thing is much better project management. When you look at many of the projects in science, a good professional project management uh, would really uh, do well. And uh, frankly, by now, I could have done my PhD work in half the time with better quality, with a good project management. And the last thing is the structure, how you organize it. And that is an example also from science. It's the ITER, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor that's built in Cadarache in France. It's a picture in the middle, a quite current picture. It's a tokamak uh, fusion research reactor. Um, the target was to have 10 times more output than input power. Uh, costs were uh, calculated 5.5 billion euros. It's 850 people on site and 2,000 worldwide. So what did they do? They broke it down in components, blanket, vacuum vessel, coils, the power supply and so forth. You have 100 components. And every manager, and it's 100 countries contributed to that, and every manager with his, with his right mind would have diagonalized matrix. Whereas the vacuum vessel from France, the cooling system from Germany and so forth. But that was not what was Every nation wanted to have influence in every component. So the project manager basically goes nuts. The matrix is completely filled here, and the result is a disaster that is kept secret. The start was in 07. It should start last year, and now we have one year of delay for every year in the project. So that basically means it will never finish. It will be costing, by now, three times as much as they are targeting 28. And the other mistake in the beginning was they scaled it down. And when you go for a fusion reactor, it's, physics are ah, complicated, but in a sense, they are also easy. In the volume, you generate the energy and you lose the energy in the surface. Volume scale, uh, scales with the radius powered by three. Surface radius powered by two. If you divide it, 
it scales with the radius of the machine. The bigger the machine, the better. If you scale it down from the very beginning, your chances that you get a working fusion are limited. It was uh, scaled down in the beginning by the politics uh, by a factor of three, so it was 1.5 gigawatts and now it's 500 megawatts. Uh, when you see that with a little bit of experience, it's really sad because it's taxpayers' money that's spent for a good purpose but uh, in a not very wise way. So management matters. But what really counts is people and value. I once asked one of my researchers, why do companies really fail? Why do they go out of market? And I don't mean a bicycle manufacturer that's bought by a second bicycle manufacturer and they still produce bicycles, but they change the name. No, they go out of business, like Enron. Um, yeah. Bad operations, too high costs and whatever. Uh, he went through the last, a young guy went through the last 100 cases worldwide that was only 15%. Wrong strategy, wrong investment, a little bit higher. When you invested long term and it turned out to be wrong, it could be a reason for bankruptcy. But the main reason was moral failure of one guy or a very small group of people. Look at the scandal uh, around the diesel at Volkswagen, for example. It's always a handful or one guy who behaves in a moral, inacceptable way, and then whole companies or whole nations uh, have really big trouble. It works the other way around as well, if you have an inspired leader and a small group of people working together. It's a recipe for success, but here we counted the negative uh, downward thing. So it's people and values that uh, count. And you can't make compromises. You may make compromises if you have a food stand here on the corner. Then if you have salmonella in your uh, stuff, uh, 10 people get sick and you are out of business. If you are McDonald's, one bad burger with salmonella would spoil the reputation of the whole chain. So you can't make compromises. You have to go to 100% and you can't allow the bad burger in your system. And no compromises. Uh, lean management, Japanese, told us there is no trade-off between quality, cost, and time. I, uh, drew it here as a triangle or a Cartesian system. It's not. Uh, even normal people say time is money and quality is quality cost. So it's one dimensional. Don't trust people that tell you it will be better quality but it will cost more. Don't trust people that tell you it will be faster but therefore you have to invest a little bit more. No, the trick is to come up with ideas that simultaneously optimize the three dimensions. They are collinear. And on strategy, it's the same. PPP, people, planet, and profit. So if somebody tells you I make a much better profit, but therefore I'm polluting the river, no good idea. I make more profit, but I treat my people unfair. No good idea. You have to look for simultaneously improving the environment for people and uh, for our Earth and uh, make a living and a profit out of it. The driver for that is uh, your value system. Uh, if that's spoiled, you might go for the compromises. If that's in order, you try to have the tough ideas that are simultaneously optimizing those dimensions. With that said, a little bit more on the private side. I said don't make the compromises, be a complete person in your profession, but there's also a saying, one-winged birds can't fly. So he will make a nosedive 
if one wing is missing. That I have stolen from my predecessor, the guy you've seen on the soccer field, the ambitious man. He was a mountaineer. He's a mountaineer. He likes to climb. His friend is uh, Reinhold Messner, the first guy who climbed the Everest uh, without oxygen in bottles, carried up there. Um, I'm not climbing mountains for the reasons I explained. I had a different second wing, and that's it. So consulting the car industry, I thought uh, I have to do something. So with 20 friends, we built that car. It's a replica of a Shelby Cobra. It has a five liter V8 Mercedes drivetrain, a chassis from Ford. Uh, and uh, this lady here, good friend of mine, Jutta Kleinschmidt, the first and only lady that did win the rally Paris Dakar. So this is on the test track, and that is my second wing. A few lessons from racing. One wing birds can't fly. Lonely single racers can't win. So my co-pilot is my wife when we do that. I'm very gracious that we share that together. And uh, even Nico Rosberg has a team of hundreds of people behind them, and he can't win alone. And uh, the second thing, it's about reliability. You have to finish first to finish first. So you have to see the target line. In my career as a race car driver, I had one mechanical failure that caused me to give up a race, and that was due to a little steel thing that connected the pedal with the clutch that was 50 years old, never greased up, so I didn't grease it up, and therefore we couldn't finish the race. And then there is a third lecture on race driving. Uh, I'm thinking how your Google translator would uh, try to cope with, mit vollen Hosen is good stinken. This is a quote from uh, Mr. Porsche, the inventor of the Volkswagen Beetle and uh, the sports cars. Um, politically incorrect. I translated incorrectly. When your trousers are full, stinking gets easy. So it was meant uh, that with more horsepower, uh, you have better uh, chances. So one-winged birds can't fly. And one dream is still left, a two-winged bird. It's a tiger moss. and. Uh, this little thing here in front is my wife uh, flying with a old-timer vintage plane. A method to have a second wing is to give something back. You are an elite. You are much smarter than anybody else. But that comes with a burden. You have a responsibility. You have a higher responsibility than anybody else is your peers. You have to do something for society. We couldn't get our own children, so I thought I'd do something for children. They are curious uh, by nature, and uh, in a country like Germany without natural resources, I thought it would be good to have them uh, get into connection with natural science very early on. So we founded the House of the little scientists, Haus der Kleinen Forscher. Uh, it's all about, we heard that yesterday, curiosity and enthusiasm or passion, and uh, that we want to spark in kindergarten uh, kids. Uh, it's easy to repair one kindergarten in your neighborhood, but real impact is if you do that in hundreds and thousands over a country, and our vision was every child. And that's where we are after 10 years. Uh, we cover nearly, in Germany, 30,000 kindergartens. The total would be 43,000, so it's much more than half. And it's very cheap experiments, and every kid can participate. We have an organization training the kindergarten teachers, training the trainers. And you see here, uh, every year we do a day of the young scientists, and here you see a PhD in physics, 
who happens to be in her second job, our chancellor, being with the uh, kindergarten kids. We use that for promotion, it's supported. And uh, frankly, I'm really proud about that. It's brainware, the experiments, we give it away for free. So in Thailand, uh, the princess of Thailand came to Lindau. A Nobel laureate was in the kindergarten. She met him there, and then she decided we will want to have that in Thailand. So we don't charge. Uh, if we have to go there and support, obviously it's a, a tiny little cost-covering fee, but the brainware is free, the experiments and everything. So it's uh, set up to be international. That was uh, my way to give something back to society, and I would recommend that in one point in time of your career as well. Don't let the world be shaped around you, shape it yourself. That it's that why I'm giving that talk today, what's happening in the US, I'm a little bit scared of that as well. And you know, there's a quote from Mark Twain, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And a hundred years ago, those three not so gentlemen set up to press their own ideas on how the world should look like, and the outcome is pretty much known. I hope in our case, uh, history doesn't rhyme itself. And uh, it's your decision, it's your generation. Um, you can decide. Either it's a steep way uphill or it's a well-paved downhill highway to hell. And there is a post sign. Our world is at crossroads at the moment. It's up to you to decide. One sign points in the direction, rational, liberal and free, inclusive and open, market economy, democracy, and ultimately peace. If you turn all that into the negative, post-truth, authoritarian, exclusive and closed, planned economy, dictatorship, it always ends up in military conflicts and war. You guys are really important. I mean, when I count here the first, second, and third row, maybe 40 people. When I was young, when I was 18, I did my military service in the city where my grandpa lived. He was over 70s, in his late 70s. So we bridged 60 years, basically. And uh, you can imagine everybody who is 20 talking to somebody who is 70. He talked about his experience as a young soldier in World War I. And I learned a lot. So you can bridge by talking to elder people 50 years. So that means Jesus and uh, Caesar is sitting there. And after 40 people, here are the medievals, and here is the Renaissance. And then you go back. After 40 people, you bridge 2,000 years. So that basically tells you how important a generation is and what you can achieve. You will find people like-minded, for example, in the scientific community. You find them in Lindau, and I guess now I'm entitled to uh, run some advertisement on Lindau. For more than 60 years, the annual Lindau Nobel Laureate meetings have brought together the world's most famous scientists. The main goals are to promote exchange between the prestigious researchers and talented young scientists and to bring science to a broader public. Societal and political themes have been discussed here, often leading to decisions with ramifications leading beyond their purely scientific core. 
At the same time, the Lindau meetings have established themselves as a respected platform for a lively exchange between young scientists and Nobel laureates. This year, you, more than 600 young scientists from 80 countries, are invited to this exchange with 37 Nobel laureates. As we convene here for a week of lectures, panels and debates, we become part of a very special community, extending a great tradition of an open exchange between generations and cultures. May you all benefit from this week and live the Lindau spirit, educate, inspire, connect. Concerned about the isolation of German science in the post-war period, in 1949, two doctors in Lindau, Dr. Franz Karl Hein and Professor Gustav Wilhelm Parade, initiated the organization of a medical congress for the Lake Constance region. To bring together the doctors and researchers with major international scientists, they had the idea of inviting Nobel laureates from the disciplines medicine, chemistry and physics to the conference. They found a prestigious sponsor in Count Lennart Bernadott. As a grandson of the Swedish King Gustav V, Bernadotte had valuable contacts to the Swedish royal family and the Nobel Committee in Sweden. In 1954, the Council for the Lindau Nobel Laureate Meetings was established, with the aim of extending contacts to universities and putting the event on a solid financial footing. Its first president was Count Bernadotte, whose dedication inspired the annual meetings in the following years. He was followed in the post by his wife Sonia, and since 2008 by their daughter Countess Bettina Bernadotte. Aber meine Damen und Herren, ich kann Ihnen sagen, dass ich Schwierigkeiten hatte mit der Stadt Lindau hier am Anfang. Die wollten nämlich den Menschen bei den Nobelpreisträger gar nicht sehen, sondern nur den Nobelpreisträger. Und es sollte alles so furchtbar feierlich sein und äh, so akademisch und so. Und ich habe gesagt, nein, Leute, lasst das, das haben die ja alles an ihren Universitäten. Lasst uns mal eine lockere und nette und menschliche Tagung machen. Ich habe fünf Jahre gebraucht, bis sich das durchgesetzt hat. Aber ich habe mich durchgesetzt, jawohl. The founders wish to embed German science into the international research context is seen in the name of the first event. Called the European Meeting of Nobel Laureates in Medicine in Lindau, it took place from the 10th to the 14th of June 1951. 30,000 invitations were sent by mail to physicians in the German-speaking countries. With a budget of 12,000 Deutschmarks, the founders were able to bring seven Nobel Laureates and some 400 participants to Lake Constance. Following the successful first meeting, the focus shifted to the search for financial sponsors and to the invitation of highly qualified young scientists. At the third conference in 1953, student participants were able to experience the laureates up close and engage in discussions with them. The Lindau meeting had found its purpose to be a platform for cross-generational exchange between outstanding scientists. At the same time, the Lindau meetings impacted society and policy and took the initiative in pushing for social political change. An early sign of this was the Mainau Declaration in 1955. All nations must come to the decision that they will voluntarily renounce violence as the last means of policy. In a time overshadowed by the Cold War and the threat of nuclear warfare, the Nobel laureates took a clear position. On July the 15th, 1955, 18 Nobel Prize winners signed the declaration, among them Max Born, Werner Heisenberg and Otto Hahn. Within a year, they were joined by 34 more Nobel Prize winners. That the destruction of uran and the thorium zu so folgenschweren und folgenreichen Ergebnissen herausgestellt hat, ahnten wir, weder Herr Strassmann noch ich, absolut nicht. Und wir hätten es weder geglaubt, noch hätten wir es gewünscht, dass diese Ergebnisse dabei herauskämen. Nämlich, dass die Nutzbarmachung der Spaltenergie der Atomkerne schon nach wenigen Jahren einen so drastischen Beweis ihrer Durchführbarkeit erbringen würden. 
wie es die Atombomben in Nagasaki und Hiroshima gezeigt haben. Und ich glaube, dass heute alle Menschen und alle Völker, die guten Willens sind, doch die Hoffnung haben, dass die segensbringenden Wirkungen der in der gesteuerten Maschine geregelten Kernenergie den Sieg davontragen möge über die Schrecken der zur Zerstörung führenden ungesteuerten Reaktionen, die zu den Bomben führen. Count Leonard Bernard Dodd had a great personal interest in environmental protection and sustainability, and he brought these themes into the discussion at the Lindau meetings early on. The 1961 Green Charter of Mainau was a further milestone in the social and political involvement of the Lindau laureates. The Charter was a call to anchor the principle of environmental protection in many aspects of public life. An issue mentioned in the Green Charter became a theme again and again in the following years, the question of the responsibility of science. In 1972, Willy Brandt, the 1971 Nobel Peace Laureate and West German Chancellor, described environmental protection as an international task. Es handelt sich nun nicht darum, die Welt das Umweltgrusel zu lehren, sondern es gilt, die Warnungen vor programmiertem Selbstmord so ernst zu nehmen, wie sie sind. Nicht, um vor den ernsten Gefahren zu resignieren, sondern um durch eine nüchterne Bestandsaufnahme rasch genug zu geeigneten Problemlösungen zu kommen. In the 1970s, the Lindau meetings also opened up to the field of economics, after Ragnar Frisch and Jan Tinbergen were awarded the first economics prize in 1969. In the ensuing years, economics laureates often took part in the interdisciplinary section, until in 2004, the first regular meeting on economic science was held in Lindau. Now societal themes from an economic perspective became a focus. In 2008, Nobel Peace Laureate Mohammad Yunus spoke about alternatives to unregulated capitalism. And in 2011, Bill Gates opened the Lindau meeting with a speech about the responsibility borne by scientific research. And I think that's why I'm, I'm excited to be here, uh, because whether those innovations are a, a new vaccine for malaria, a new seed that helps uh, farmers with very little farmland to grow not only enough uh, for their family, but enough to afford to send their kids to schools. Uh, these type of breakthroughs, I think, are exactly uh, the opportunities that all of you young scientists will be able to participate in. And so as I uh, congratulate you on your, your progress so far, I'd admonish you to consider uh, the needs of the poorest in the work that you do, because I think the advances there uh, will be particularly important, and without uh, your attention to them, uh, it's possible they will not take place. The 50th anniversary of the meeting in the year 2000 saw the establishment of the Foundation Lindau Nobel Laureate Meetings. Chaired by Professor Wolfgang Schürer, the Foundation continues to inspire and influence the meeting in many ways. Since the beginning of the new millennium, the Lindau Nobel Laureate Meetings have initiated activities and projects to carry science out to the public beyond the annual gatherings. These include the Lindau-Nobel.org website, the Lindau Science Blog, the online alumni directory and the Media Tick, a unique collection of educational videos, scientific abstracts and lectures from more than 60 years by more than 400 Nobel Laureates. Other activities, including the Sketches of Science exhibition and numerous publications, are part of the mission education created by the Council and the Foundation. Its aim is to propagate the scientific dialogue initiated in Lindau sustainably, globally, and even beyond the boundaries of the Earth. Like you in your research, I feel like an explorer. The same curiosity that brought you to your Laureate Science findings brought me to this laboratory in space, the Columbus module of the International Space Station. Day by day, on board this unique laboratory, we downlink science data, we collect samples for return to Earth, we get new instructions from the investigators who have proposed the experiments, 
we optimize the experiment processes, we analyze the results and discuss in a way that Columbus himself would have never dreamt about. So you see, we have always been a little bit ahead of the time. The avant-garde, that's what we want to be, and to quote one of my fellow citizens, Kurt Tucholsky, a writer, the avant-garde is always fired at from behind. So go out and simply do it, be the avant-garde, shape that world to a better place, come to Linda, you are all invited, obviously you have to apply, we select quite rigorously, but I don't have uh, doubts that many of you uh, would qualify. And with that, and the upcoming Chinese New Year, I wish you peace, health, and success in 2017. And that's a picture of the car at uh, New Year's Eve. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for having me here in Singapore.